Okay, we're ready to go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the Board of Estimate and Apportionment hearing on the budget. Um, Ms. Green, please call the roll. Mayor Jones. Present. Comptroller Green. Here. President Reed. Here. All present. Great. Um, today we will have our annu uh, annual public hearing about the budget. This meeting is being held in accordance with provisions of ordinance number 49318 approved on March 2nd, 1959, which states in part, the Board of Estimate and Apportionment shall review the proposed budget with the heads of departments and other agencies and hold at least one public hearing thereon after giving at least five days notice in the city journal. The required notice was published in the St. Louis City Journal on Tuesday, April 12th and April 19th, 2022, and in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on Monday, April 11th. Um, there are 55 people who are signed up to provide testimony today. We will call you in the order that we received your request. Um, you will have, is it two minutes, Mrs. Green? Yes, we'd like them to keep it to two minutes to allow for as many participants as possible. Exactly, we'd like to keep your, we'd like you to keep your testimony to two minutes. Mrs. Stephanie Green will be um, the timekeeper. And uh, Mrs. Green, how will you notify our participants uh, when they are close to the limit? I'll give them a, a one finger when they're halfway through. And then I'll do sort of a wrap up like this when it's 30, 30 seconds. Gotcha. So please pay attention to Mrs. Green. Um, and uh, once we hit two minutes, um, we will, um, well, she'll hit the, she, you'll see her fist. And then um, we will ask you to wrap up your testimony. I want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to speak. Um, and uh, so we will get started. Our first uh I will call you and then please unmute yourself. And if you'd like to show us your camera, you're more than welcome. Our first participant this morning is Mr. Jerry Connolly. Good morning, uh, Madam Mayor, Madam Comptroller, President Reed. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks more like kind of bullet points of items, some of which you've heard me talk about before um, at previous ENA hearings. Um, unfortunately, in many of these areas, there hasn't been progress um, in the last five years, which I find very disappointing. Um, if we're to have true accountability in government, we need greater transparency. The city is improve transparency in many areas, such as the Board of Aldermen meetings and the uh, committees um, being posted on YouTube. However, some of the most important agencies in the city do not have their meetings archived on YouTube. It's very simple to do this. The development boards in particular for St. Louis Development Corporation need to be posted online. Um, that's my number one request. Um, that special taxing districts, which there's been a fair amount written about. There's been an audit by um, Auditor Galloway's office that came out in 2019. Sadly, there has been little action since then by the city. So I'd urge you as a board of ENA and also St. Louis Development Corporation and the registers office to implement the recommendations from that 29 audit, uh, which is available online. Um, the taxing districts also are not included. Um, I believe it's a next step from the mayor's office uh, to add those to the boards and commissions website. That new website is a huge step forward and very much appreciate that being added. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there are boards on there where many members are serving on unexpired terms, particularly on the development boards. There are people who've served for, I mean, literally over a decade um, a couple of people on the Port Authority are on expired terms, and one of them, I believe, was appointed in 2008 to that board. I think we should have a moratorium on the creation of new districts until a thorough review of the current districts has been conducted. 
the conflicts of interest, particularly on the developer-controlled districts, um, are just vast, staggering, and I don't think developers who've already received tax incentives should be given control of a local governing authority um, where they basically get to spend, you know, taxpayers' money, um, and they don't post their meetings online. They meet maybe once a year, and they essentially operate in secrecy. Um, the second entity group of entities are the 353 corporations, such as SLU and the Central West End WashU Medical Complex. Um, they deserve greater scrutiny. I encourage you to look at that closely. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Next is, I am sorry, I'm going to butcher this last name, uh, Jeffrey's, um, Jeffrey S. I, I don't need to <laughs> attempt it. Jeffrey S. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Jones. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Soyetet. I am the Executive thank Director you. of Nintendo for Africa. Uh, we work with immigrants and refugees. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for the team at for St. Louis City uh, for creating a welcoming city for our immigrants community. Uh, but I wanted to mention, uh, the reason I'm here, I wanted to share a little bit some of the opportunities that are there, especially reaching out to the African immigrant community, uh, because we realize most of them, uh, they, uh, they lost between. It's either immigrants, then we talk about immigrants, then more fo there's more focus of, of mostly on the Hispanic community. And then uh, when you talk about the black community, then the needs are not met because we are not actually the African immigrant, African Americans. And because of that, some of the challenges and programs that are set, they're actually not able to meet the unique needs of the African community, which is very big in actually in the St. Louis city, those who come through the International Institute. Uh, and the reason why we also wanted to share with you uh, is because also uh, most of the families, they come big, uh, the big families, we are blessed with big families, but we miss a lot on uh, when it comes to the housing. So we need, we are look, trying to see if we can be able to work with the city and do some housing project or affordable housing project uh, programs for the, the city, uh, for the immigrants uh, who are settling in the city. At the same time, it's also working with the programs of the mental health with cultural competence staff that are able to understand the challenges that are there. Also the issue of language, it becomes a big challenge when you're working with other programs that are there with the people who may not be able to understand the, uh, the language barrier that comes with the immigrants. So we're so excited and we look forward to see how we can be able to work together to make life easier for the immigrants. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Next thank up, you. Sarah Nixon. Sarah Nixon going once, Sarah Nixon going twice. Okay, moving on to the next person, Nathaniel King. Nathaniel King. Hi, thank you. Uh, you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Looks like I'm gonna speak from the dark. Can you all hear me today? Tony, yes, can we can you hear you. Understand? Excellent, you thank you. Hi. Uh, so I'm from you. The, I'm here for the eighth ward, and I'm here to advocate for the defunding of SWAT, the real time crime center, and Shot Spotter. Special <laughs> weapons and tactics is a uh, euphemism for military weapons and tactics, and a military mindset changes citizens in St. Louis into enemy combatants, making it so much dangerous, more dangerous for us to live here. Additionally, the real time crime spotter and Shot Spotter are overly complicated financial boondoggles, as has been reported in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Surveillance doesn't improve public safety. It simply shows us what has happened in the past. If we want to improve public safety, we ought to be, we oughtn't to be uh, in funding mass surveillance states or treating our citizens like enemy combatants. We should be in funding programs like Cure Violence. Cure Violence trains community members to intervene in conflicts. In the first year in St. Louis, they were able to reduce homicide rate by 60% in the four neighborhoods in which they were uh, active. 
the surveillance and SWAT budget represent over $3 million in funding. I am here to ask you to cut that funding and invest it in our community. Technological solutions sound good, but what we need are human-based solutions. I really appreciate your time today and I hope you take my comments under advice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jake Lionfields. Good morning, President Reed, Mayor Jones, and Comptroller Green. Good morning. Um, I appreciate you taking my comment today. I live in the 20th Ward, just south of Cherokee Street. And um, specifically, I, I wanted to start by thanking Mayor Jones and Comptroller Green for their past leadership in making the kind of investments that our city needs to achieve real public safety. Um, during the last budgetary cycle, we saw a reduction in the monies allocated for the overtime fund. And instead, those dollars were invested into social services, affordable housing, and our prosecutor's office. Those are the kinds of investments that we need to achieve real public safety in the city of St. Louis. Additionally, I can't thank Comptroller Green enough for her uh, report. Uh, I think it was about five or six years ago now, where she documented uh, rampant abuse of the overtime fund by SLMPD. And she noted that. Um, you know, there were substantial documentation errors, errors in um, procedure being followed to approve overtime, um, gross negligence by SLMPD leadership on how overtime funds were used. Um, that kind of scrutiny and accountability is exactly what we should expect from our citywide elected officials. I urge uh, the Board of Estimate and Apportionment to continue scrutinizing the dollars that we are spending on the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. We have one of the highest staffed police departments per capita in the entire country. We also see um, a lot of questionable behaviors by our police department. And we know that police are often used to respond to a crime rather than to prevent it. So I'm really excited about our leadership on ENA and the kinds of decisions that y'all have made in the past. And I'm urging you to continue um, demonstrating that leadership by continuing to reduce the funds invested as, in SLMPD, especially as it relates to surveillance and the militarization of our police department, and instead continue redirecting those monies towards uh, affordable housing, helping folks who are unhoused and social services. So thank you for your time so much, and I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jake. Next up is Inez Bordeaux. Good morning. Um, I want to thank the board of ENA for doing this. I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure two minutes is enough. I feel like I really need about five minutes. Um, but I wanted to start by saying, oh, I'm sorry. My name is Inez Bordeaux. I live in the ninth ward. I'm the ninth ward committee woman. Um, and I'm an organizer with the defund re -Envision, transform campaign to start. I want to ask, why do we continue to invest the bulk of our general fund budget into the arrest and incarcerate model when the answer to our problems very clearly isn't the police? The answer is right there. It's investment in the people. I remember last year when the campaign first started, we crunched the numbers and we were able to determine that we invest $185,000 per police officer in this city. That $185,000 includes their salary, their training, their pension, their health care, their badge and their gun, the cost of their uniform, everything. And I want to say that I have never seen the city invest $185,000 into any single person. Person. Many neighborhoods don't get that kind of investment, and yet we're investing it into a police officer that is going to go on to unrest and incarcerate many of the most marginalized people in this city. For $185,000, we can put 22 people through college for two years and get them an associate's degree. That would do more to reduce poverty.
poverty and reduce crime than any one police officer could. For the cost of another police officer, we could afford to pay the rent for all 22 of those families while those people are going through their educational process. For the cost of that Tahoe that the police are driving in that was paid for or going to be paid for by our ARPA money, we could buy laptops and school supplies and printers and other things to support those people while they're in college. It's time to stop investing in the police. It's time to start investing in us. And I do believe that if we believe in ourselves and we invest in the people of this city, St. Louis would be better, not just for rich people, but for all people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Willie Boyd. Uh, on, here I am, having trouble getting on mute. Okay, please proceed. Yes. Uh, morning. My name is uh, Willie Boyd. I speak on the circuit attorney, Kimberly Gardner's request for the $1 million for the independent internal investigative unit. Because of the two minute time limit, I won't be sp speaking on the witness protection uh, program. The circuit attorney's office really needs maybe $5 million to be effective in addressing years of police misconduct and abuse and abuse of authority and the cover up of wrongdoing. Police officers, as we know, cannot investigate themselves. We witness time and again police cover ups and the police department turning a blind eye to wrongdoing. Like in the case of police officer killing of Garland Carter, not only did Edward Sanchez murder Garland, but it was documented Sanchez had three unauthorized throwaway weapons in his police trunk a starter pistol, a play gun, and a 22 pistol. Then we had a case of the killing of Lamar Johnson Smith by Jason Stockley. Not only did he murder Lamar, but Officer, but officer uh, 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 Stockley was riding around with an unauthorized assault weapon. In the case of the killing of police officer Catlin Alex by police officer uh, uh, Nathaniel Hendricks, police officer Nathaniel Hendricks and Patrick uh, Reardon were at Hendricks' home when the murder occurred. Both of these officers were not in their assigned police area. Plus it is documented that they were drinking while on patrol. So it appears to be police culture that they are above the law and police policy. The police force investigative unit cannot investigate their own. With Luther Hall as an example, they look for police officers to take one for the team to cover up police corruption. Circuit Attorney Kimler Gardner needs twice that money to address real culture of corruption. I have, I have a lot to say, but this is a short time in which to say it. But we know that St. Louis has have, had a problem with police corruption for years. We had to jump out boys with Bobby Garrett, Reggie Williams, uh, Leon Liston, which uh, established a whole corruption team that was robbing citizens. You know, so we need this money in order for there to be real investigations. Thank you for Thank much, you so much. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Next up is Hattie Swoboda Stell. Patty Swoboda. Hello. Thank you, Mayor Jones. 
Mm -hmm. um, thank you, everyone. My name is Hattie Swodestel. I live in the eighth ward, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And I also second Jake's comments in thanking Mayor Jones and Comptroller Green for past leadership towards the betterment of our city. Um, I'm here as a citizen of St. Louis to advocate against the majority of our proposed fiscal year 23 general fund budget being allocated towards police, police retirement, police specific units and other departments, including facilities management, equipment services and the city councilor. To put into perspective the extreme difference in amounts being spent on policing versus other public services in this proposed budget, for every dollar allocated towards policing, less than a penny is being spent on health and hospitals and less than a penny would be spent on human services. There are over 1800 city staff focused on policing in comparison to the six staff focused on, on the Affordable Housing Commission. That is a difference that speaks um, really loudly towards the uh, difference in how we approach the problems in the city. Um, I believe there are obvious places in the budget from which all the funds to be reallocated, such as eliminating 52 additional vacant positions from the police department, uh, pulling out 97% of funding for SWAT, which ends that same percentage of its time deploying search warrants, uh, many times leading to deadly consequences, and pulling additional funding that's been requested towards the Real-Time Crime Center and Shot Spotter, which has been described by an 11-year SL and PD veteran as being less efficient and less in the same job as police. Policing doesn't make our city safe. It rips community members away from their families, their jobs, their lives, and cages them in a devastating and dangerous jail, which leads people to do devastating and dangerous things. Instead um, of allowing, I think, nonprofits and volunteer initiatives to do the job of creatively addressing and responding to the needs of the citizens of, of St. Louis, I propose our city wholeheartedly support and expand the efforts made by those organizations and those volunteers and to proven alternatives. Um, one example could be instead of relying on volunteers to organize safe havens during the winter months, uh, our city needs to immediately implement an expansive 24-7 housing shelter. Uh, our city can expand uh, different services towards people who are being held at the Justice Center, such as sponsored recon programs by the Freedom Community Center. All in all, our city, I believe, would be much better by spending its funds on supporting the people of the city and not the police. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Mr. James Ozier. Again, a quick reminder that if you are not speaking or not a member of staff, please turn your cameras off and, your, and remain on mute. Proceed, Mr. Ozier. Yes, uh, my name is Jay Ozier and I'm testifying on behalf of the need of the establishment of a public integrity internal uh, investigative unit within the office of the circuit attorney to investigate, prosecute, and convict law enforcement official officers accused of using excessive force resulting in the in dangerous injury and death of a human being. If we want our if we want safer streets, then it starts at home in the institutions that fund public safety. And no one is above the law, including the police. The second component is the witness protection program to provide critical support and protection for citizens who have witnessed a serious crime, agreed to testify in open court, and have received credible threats to their personal safety and well-being because they have agreed to testify. Our circuit attorney ran on a campaign of criminal justice reform, and she is doing just that. With the staunchest resistance, uh, uh, with the staunchest of resistance that any one person can receive. These two programs 
as mentioned earlier, will be an important next step in making our streets and our community safest. The ball is in your court. I know you would do the right thing in providing the necessary funding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ozier, for keeping your remarks to two minutes exactly. Uh, up next is Lisa Legron. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. My name is Lisa Legron, and I'm coming here to testify about the Witness Protection Program. I'm with the Organization for Black Struggle. I am the coordinator for Project Haki, the anti violence program in the 22nd Ward. I'm coming here as a grandmother and a community person because I think the witness program is really important. Back in November, my grandson was shot in his head three times in front of the Cure Violence building on uh, Belt and Natural Bridge. The young man that, who they were shooting at, his mother house had got shot up prior to that. And she shared with me that she needed to be able to move, she didn't have the funding. Also, another, pro, another uh, incident is with a kid that I'm working with in the community. A young man that witnessed a murder. He didn't go to court to testify. They let the little boy out. The little boy came out. He shot them. Two, he shot him two weeks later with three other people, and the young lady was murdered. So the witness program is a very important program, and I hope that you all can really consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Legron. Next up. Tony Taylor. I don't see Tony Taylor. We can move on. Okay, Tony Taylor is not here. Next up, Zaki Baruti. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, greet uh, Mayor uh, Jones, uh, Controller Darlene Green, and my good friend, uh, President uh, Lewis Reed. Um, my name, of course, is Ike Baruti, and I'm representing the Community Justice Coalition, which is a group of organizations that have come together to speak to the justice, uh, social justice changes that Circuit Attorney uh, Kim Gordon, Gordon would like to implement because of the many, over the years, rogue police officers uh, brutalizing and killing our people. In fact, uh, a few examples that have already been incited included the high profile cases such as Marilyn Banks, Garland Carter, Julius Thurman, Gary Ball, Vine Derrick uh, Myers, Kajima Powell, uh, as well as Anthony Lamar Smith, just uh, for a few. So I'm, <clears throat> along with uh, the Community Justice Coalition, also I represent the Universal African People's Organization, and we wholeheartedly support the funding for Kim Gardner's uh, request to uh, build and develop an independent investigative unit, as well as uh, um, funding for her uh, witness protection program. So I just urge each of you to support the funding because uh, we need to hold these police officers accountable. And as you know, uh, um, the cases of police shootings, I think in St. Louis ranks uh, number one uh, per capita across this country. So I'm sure that each of you will do the right thing and find her uh, request uh, to the tune of, I believe she's asking 1.7 million that would cover both um, uh, the independent investigative unit as well as the witness protection program. Thank you. May God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Wale Amusa. Wale Amusa. I'm here. Please proceed. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Troller Darlene Green, Mayor Tishara Jones, and uh, Mr. President of the Board, Louis Reed. Good morning. My name is Wale Amusa, and I'm the co chair of the Campaign for Human Dignity which is also a member of the St. Louis Community Justice Coalition. I am here today to ask for your support 
in allocating $1.7 million for a public integrity unit to investigate mis police misconduct and to establish a witness pr protection program in the circuit attorney's office. As many of you do know, St. Louis was founded in 1764. For over 200 years, black people have suffered through slavery and Jim Crow in St. Louis. And all along those years, there was a police department that was used to enforce those arbitrary violations, massive violations of the human rights of black people. Today, we still have a police department that has never been fully responsive to the needs of African-American taxpayers in this city. We all know that the issue of police accountability is a national crisis, is a local crisis, and is a national and local priority. Today, I have to say that my heart is very, very warm because there is hope. For the first time since St. Louis was incorporated as a city in 1823, we have three African-American leaders on the Board of Estimate and Apportionment who can make a difference. You have the power to reorder budget priorities to meet the urgent great needs of people in this community. You have the power to say to St. Louis City taxpayers, especially African-Americans, that they deserve to be respected by those who have sworn to serve and protect them. So I urge you with all earnestness and all deference and respect, I urge you to please support the allocation of $1.7 million to the circuit attorney's you know, budget so that these two programs, public integrity unit and a witness protection program can be implemented. Thank you so much. And uh, we love you and we respect you. And we appreciate everything that you're doing for the voters and the taxpayers of the city of St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Carol Jackson. Good morning uh, to all of the board. Um, I really appreciate the time that uh, you've given me to speak and I appreciate your service uh, and your leadership. My name is Carol Jackson and I am a retired police commander with over 40 years of service. I am here in support of the circuit attorney's request for funding of the Independent Eternal Investigation Unit, as well as the Witness Communication and Protection Program. This city, I believe, can never see its full potential or be the beacon uh, to residents to draw people here or the glue to maintain the residents uh, without public trust or everything about government. The lack of such can sometimes bring a corrosion that is irreversible. And it's no secret that our city is known nationally for our high crime rate and our murder rates. And unfortunately, our number of police involved shootings, though sometimes unmerited. Citizens want transparency and they want trust and they want believability. And the board and the road to achieve this is establish an independent internal investigative unit. Citizens are and victims and witnesses of crime. They want to feel safe and they want to feel protected. And this can be achieved by the establishment of the Witness Communication and Protection Program. I've traveled around the state and also the country to evaluate uh, law enforcement agencies for adhering to national standards to achieve accredited status. Most of these agencies uh, in past years already have these programs in place. And our city as a progressive city with so much to offer, we should be on board as well. Thank you for your time and I appreciate you praying for you and I thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Thank you. Next up, Tammy Buffert. Good morning. Um, 
Thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Tammy Bufford. I live in the 25th Ward. Um, I am here today to testify because uh, I feel that we need a uh, public integrity unit for uh, the city of St. Louis because my son Cortez Bufford was murdered um, by St. Louis police officer Lucas Roethlisberger on December 12, 2019. Um, the FIU unit was supposed to do an investigation, but they have shown that they either cannot or, or will not uh, investigate themselves. They um, did a poor job of doing any type of investigation in these allegations. The officer murdered my son and nothing has been done for that. Um, the circuit attorney needs money and funding in order to conduct investigations in regards to uh, police involved shootings and deaths. And they actually need the funding in order to conduct unbiased uh, investigations. So I ask that you fund the, um, the 1.2 million that they're asking for, for the public integrity union and also the $500 million in order to cover uh, the witness protection. The monies that is going to uh, fund the police where the bulk of your budget is going, some of that funds can be directed into that unit in order to get unbiased uh, investigations done in order to um, police, uh, investigate the police. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up, Lou Moy. Good morning, uh, officers of the Board of ENA and staff. Thank you for uh, holding this, this very important hearing this today. My name is Lou Moy, and I'm president and mayor of the St. Louis chapter of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. But I'm here, like some of my other colleagues, representing the Community Justice Coalition, which is a broad faith uh, labor community organization. And I'm here to support also, as some have said, uh, uh, two budget items in our circuit attorney's office uh, one is, is the uh, uh, Integrity Investigative Unit, uh, $1.2 million, and the Witness Protection Program of $500,000. And those are uh, two, two areas of criminal justice reform that our circuit attorney has uh, uh, focused on. And, and, and basically, it's to deal with, with rogue and careless law enforcement officers who use it excessive for that result in, in, in a lot of cases uh, wrong for death. And uh, the other one is it, it to deal with uh, uh, actually to prosecute citizens who uh, uh, commit uh, violent crimes uh, in our community. And, and both of these items will deal with that. See, two of the most significant factors contributing to a non-conviction of a violent offender occurs when there is insufficient evidence and a lack of credible witnesses. And when a homicide occur, when, when a killing occurred from a police shooting, two, two investigations take place. One of those investigations, uh, is to see if a crime was committed. The other one to see if, if police policy will follow. Both of these are done by the police and it's time to stop that. And that's just like if I, if I committed a shooting and then I asked my, my adult children and my brothers to do the investigation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Moy. Next Thank up. You. LaWanda Griffin. Good morning. Good morning. 
Good morning. Na- Good morning. My name is LaWanda Griffin. I am speaking in reference to the Witness Protection Program. I'm asking that you give the funding that is needed be- to continue this program because it is desperately needed. Um, My son, his children's mother, my nephew, and my two grandchildren were in a car. Um, They had an accident and the guy ended up getting out the car and coming to their car and killing everybody except uh, my granddaughter. She survived my seven-year-old by the grace of God because he shot her in the head as well. Everybody else died. Um, and they, they started threatening the guy from the beginning. So him being in protective custody was really an important situation because number one, he was protected. Number two, he was there to testify against the guy that did this to my family. So I'm just saying that we need that funding is very important and it's in in dire need. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Griffin. Thank you so much, Ms. Griffin, for sharing uh, your story today. Thank you. Next up, Chiquita Hill. Chiquita Hill. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sorry about that. Good morning, Madam uh, Mayor. Controller and everyone. I'd like to say thanks for this honor on speaking um, on the passing of this bill. I would like uh, to say the only reason why I say to defund the police department is not so that we don't have officers. Some people need to understand what defunding means, first off. I would like those funds to be reallocated into social services. I'm right now, I'm a single mother. I'm also a student at Forest Park Community College uh, for social services, and I'm willing to learn. And I also feel it takes village. And right now, I just see my city being, it's just a desperate city right now. And I believe that we need to get to the root of the problem. And before there is a problem, it's a condition that causes problem. And by myself, I'm also disabled. I think that labels on you, and they don't even know who you are without trying to understand you. And it is a lack of communication that we all have with being human beings. And it's a lack of compassion. And the city is desperately crying out from the homeless that could be hopeful, such as myself. I think these funds could be put towards more women's shelters who have children, such as myself. Without those type of programs or it being a shortage of them, women with kids do not have any alternatives. That's why it's a lot of young women, I believe, are out here in the positions they are because no one cared. So with that being said, it's a lack of social service workers and therapists in our community and psychiatrists, that money should be put towards behavioral health care. People need counseling, including children. I have a daughter that's ready to go to college and one graduated last year at Bush Stadium. She doesn't know what to do. All she sees is trauma. Sirens cause trauma. Um, I'm a victim of domestic violence, but I've survived. And I took care of my kids here in the city with programs such as Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Salvation Army, those type of programs that lost funding due to COVID. People need to think about those because those programs are also in schools. So we need to 
start directly, you know, with people that understand kids also are traumatized. Put that towards foster children who are getting out back into the streets, such as myself, and that's learning how to get back into society. Young men also that are in jail, that have mental ailments. Um, it's hard out here with child support. I just, it's just a lot going on. So those type of programs, other than caging up people and try to see mentally where they're coming from, it will be a great assistance for us all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Next up, David Bozier. Good morning, board members. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Dave Boger, an eighth ward resident. The city's justice system has five parts, the police, the circuit attorney, the courts, our two prisons, and the people of St. Louis. These first four parts represent our most obvious city investment in structural racism. The circuit attorney's office is the only one of the four that has any credence as working against that racism. The court systems and corrections are budgeted at 100% of what they ask for. The circuit attorney's office is budgeted at 81% of what it asks for, the lowest percentage budgeted of these four parts of our justice system. You should fully fund the new police integrity unit and witness protection programs at the 1.6 million asked for up from the 1.2 million you budgeted. You should fund the city attorney as you fund the courts and corrections at 100%. The police are our spear point for structural racism. They budge, their budget includes a million dollars for asset forfeiture. Asset forfeiture lets them seize anything that they choose and it's now theirs. Most people don't have the wealth to fight these seizures in court. Asset forfeiture paid for most of the $12.7 million cost of the new police building. Asset forfeiture doesn't target the million dollar criminals. It targets the poor who can never go to court. You should eliminate asset forfeiture. It embodies racism. You should also refund lead poisoning control, which is at zero for two years in a row. Lead is a fundamental precursor to being sucked into the justice system. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boger. Thank you. Next up, Tanisha Bayless. Tanisha Bayless. She's not here. Okay. Next up, Joseph Yancey. Good morning, Mayor Jones, <clears throat> President Reed and Comptroller Green. My name is Joe Yancey. I'm the retired former CEO of Places for People. I also um, serve on the Regional Health Commission and chairs community advisory board. I am here this morning to speak uh, and advocate on behalf of two major objectives uh, coming out of the uh, office of the circuit attorney and asking that uh, funding be provided to build the capacity to meet these objectives. Uh, the first is holding officers accountable by investig investigating and prosecuting um, when appropriate um, uh, instances of uh, use of excessive force and wrongful deaths and protecting witnesses uh, against intimidation when they are willing to testify in open court. Since uh, January of 2014, I have on a weekly basis every Thursday held a group for family members who have lost uh, a loved one to gun violence. And in that respect, uh, these two objectives and funding them would go a long way to addressing their emotional um, anguish that I see on a weekly basis. So specifically asking that the uh, public, public integrity unit uh, be established and that there be funding for that uh, at a tune of $1.2 million. And secondly, uh, specifically that um, 
uh, there be funding for a witness protection program. Um, at the very minimum, uh, these individuals, and Ms. Bufford was one earlier that you heard from, who's been part of our group, need to know that they have received an unbiased, fair, and objective uh, investigation. Um, this will go a long way towards uh, uh, trust, uh, um, equity, and um, frankly, public safety for our city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Nancy. Next up, Kevin Liddy. Thank you, members of the Board of Estimate and Apportionment for giving me the opportunity to speak before you. My name is Kevin Liddy and I am the Republican Absentee Supervisor for the Board of Election Commissioners. I started my position in October, 2020 and I live in the 16th Ward. My message is simple. I would like the board to support the funding of the Department of Personnel Administrative Regulation 101, which has been on the book since August 8th, 1979. It is a tuition assistance for employees. I forwarded a copy of the regulation to Stephanie Green two days ago so that you would have it in hand. My alderman, Tom Oldenburg, recently wrote to me that funding regulation 101 aligns with the mayor's stated goals of employee retention and experience. An email exchange with Mr. Paul Payne dated February 1st, 2022, he stated he was not aware of any funds budget for tuition assistance. An email exchange with Mrs. Sylvia Donaldson dated February 2nd, 2022, she stated the city's tuition assistance program is currently unfunded and has been for a number of years. I truly believe that a well-educated city workforce would be a win-win for a situation for the city. As citizens and employees who further their education, it's been very well documented that employee education is one of the best ways to retain employees, encourage a positive attitude, give employees a sense of value and self-worth, be more confident in their jobs when they have more to offer. I believe many of our city employees value further in their education. I know two colleagues of mine who would take advantage of such a program during the downtime between elections. I believe that the funding should be at the citywide level so that no department head must make sacrifices between his or her operating budget and educating his or her employees. Thank you for your time and education and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. Next up, Linda Wynn. Good morning, Mayor Jones, President Reed, and Comptroller Green. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning on the importance of increasing the city's current funding for affordable housing trust fund. Uh, my name is Linda, and I currently oversee all the anti-displacement programming here at Park Central Development. Uh, Park Central is a nonprofit CDC uh, that serves over a dozen neighborhoods in St. Louis and hundreds of low-income residents each year. Um, Park Central has been a proud recipient of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund for the last four years. Uh, this funding has provided us provide our organization with the staff capacity to uh, run our community resource counseling program where we work one-on-one -on -one with low-income households to connect them to resources so that they can stay in their home. Um, every year we have seen the need of our developing neighborhoods grown and more and more residents reaching out to us to be connected to basic things like food, utility assistance, rental assistance, transportation, even child care, which is a growing need in our neighborhood. Uh, last year, we provided over 175 households with direct community resource counseling. Of, the, of those 175 households, 25% had no stable income coming in due to many reasons related to COVID, like job loss, decreased work hours, young children at home. We had 32%, that's over 57 households who live on less than $1,000 in income each month. This includes many of our seniors who are on fixed incomes like Social Security. We all know personally the cost of inflation on everyday items that we buy um, in the last few months. The cost of gas, the cost of groceries, everything has gone up. Even the cost of milk and eggs, right? Everything has gone up 15 to 20 percent. Trying to run a place-based organization has been very difficult and we ask that you increase the cost, uh, increase the city's budget for affordable housing to keep track with the growing cost of not only everyday things like labor and supplies, but also that so we can retain our staff. We are having very, very hard time retaining and recruiting uh, talented staff to work with our clients. And we ask that you increase the um, current 
$6.5 million to, to at least 30% this year. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Zen Kalmiz. Zen Kalmiz going once. Not present. Okay. Moving along, next up, Jay Shepherd. Good morning. My name is Jay. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I live in the 25th Ward, and I'm the abolition organizer at Action St. Louis. I want to thank you all for allowing public comment today. And I'm here to advocate for cutting funding from SLMPD. Just as this administration zeroed out the budget for the workhouse, we need to zero out the budget for the police. They are actively harming our communities, and every dollar spent to the police is a dollar spent um, invested in funding violence. If budgets are more value statements, then it calls into question what our city values when we spend 32% of the general fund budget on police and 0.02% on health and human services. I wanna talk about My Dream St. Louis. My Dream St. Louis is one of vast and infinite resources. A St. Louis where we fund shelters, services for the unhoused and free housing instead of a police department that kills more people per capita than any police department in the country. A St. Louis where we massively increase funding for early childhood education instead of SLMPD that continuously criminalizes black and brown youth. A St. Louis where every St. Louisan has access to nutritious food, a livable wage, free public Wi-Fi, and a robust public transit system instead of constant surveillance from ShotSpotter and the Real-Time Crime Center. A St. Louis where we fund participatory budgeting so St. Louis's can direct um, public resources to meet their needs instead of a hyper-militarized SWAT team that has maced and tear gassed me without warning, body slammed and dragged my friends, and threatened to bust out my windows all for protesting the murder of a child. A St. Louis where we fund non-police responder programs to handle mental health crises, traffic stops, and so much more instead of an officer with a gun who will use force at any conceivable moment. It certainly will refund therapy, caseworkers, and other mental health resources for people to heal instead of funding more trauma. The streets of St. Louis would feel more safe for me if we invested in fixing all these potholes and divested from SLMPD. Schools have been closing, rents are rising, and police violence has been increasing. And we can make St. Louis a safe and inspiring place to live work and thrive, but we need to invest in public schools, affordable housing, accessible transit, health equity, universal, health, uh, universal childcare, environmental justice, instead of police and jails. I know we can have the St. Louis that we all deserve. And I ask that you all help make this dream a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Todd Martin. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Jones. It's good to see you all today. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. My name is Todd Martin, and for the past four years, I have had the privilege of serving as Mission St. Louis's Director of Home Repair. Our program serves senior citizens throughout the city with minor to moderate home repairs. I would like to take my time today to tell you a brief story, and it's a particularly special story to me, because it was only made possible through public dollars and in particular, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Furthermore, it was the first of several stories like this that illustrate the tremendous impact that this funding has had on our program, but more importantly, the, the participants we serve through it. This story is of Miss M. When I first met Miss M, she told me that she had to boil water on her stovetop so she could take a warm bath at night. Miss N's home had galvanized pipes throughout and they were corroding to the point that they were choking the supply to her bathroom. With flexible funding through Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we were able to hire a local licensed certified plumber to come in, run new supply lines, a new faucet and a shower head to her bathroom. What was particularly memorable 
of this story for me was when I spoke to Miss M a few months after the repairs were done, just to follow up. And she told me how grateful she was and even confided in me an embarrassing truth that in the following weeks after the repair was completed, that she occasionally caught herself warming up water on the stove instead of just turning on the bathroom tub. Her eyes were full of tears as she thanked me. And she said an incredible truth that she never has to do that again. This is one of nearly 400 stories that Mission St. Louis has, um, stories of tremendous life-changing impact that could only have been made possible with public funding and the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. We respectfully request that you continue to invest in the home repair programs throughout the city for our seniors. From myself, Mission St. Louis, and all of our programs participants, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Next up, Zachary Kyle. Hello, hello, thank you so much. I'm here to testify specifically on the funds proposed for the police. Um, I currently live in the seventh ward, but I spend a considerable amount of time working with the Organization for Black Struggle in the 22nd ward. I'm also privileged to have recently studied and graduated from the University of Cambridge with a master's in criminology. It's important for the folks here to understand that research demonstrates little to no relationship between money spent on police and crime rates over the past 60 years. Instead, some of the best predictors of violence are systemic inequities, such as poverty, access to opportunity, racism, and so forth. It's easy to advocate for any sum of money for police budgets because it provides an illusion of safety, but this fights violence with violence, and we've seen this with the killings of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Michael Brown, and many, many others here at home. The good news is that we have alternative responses to conflict right in our backyard. This week, I had the privilege to meet with pioneers from Atlanta, Baltimore, and St. Paul, who met in St. Louis to learn from our grassroots organizations tackling violence mostly without the police, including places like the Freedom Community Center, Story Stitchers, Cure Violence, and also our very own Project Hockey in the 22nd Ward. Many of these initiatives value community accountability rather than punishment, and they prevent violence by centering relationships and solidarity. While interacting with these folks over the past week, they were amazed and they were extremely excited at St. Louis's work and experimenting with alternative responses to violence. And so I'll wrap up by saying we should not hesitate in leading the vanguard for reimagining public safety. I ask you all to take money from the police department and use it for more holistic, relationship-oriented, community-strengthening approaches, like the initiatives I mentioned earlier and those echoed by Jay, Chiquita, and Inez. This is the right way to respond to conflict and violence, and it will undoubtedly have a more positive effect than the police. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kyle. Thank you. Next up, Christopher Wilcox. Christopher Wilcox. I don't see Mr. Wilcox either. Okay. Next up, Patricia Gandy. Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning, Mayor Jones, President Reed, and Controller Green. Thank you all for this space today. Good morning. My name is Latricia Gandy. I'm an organizer with Breaking the School to Prison Pipeline with Metropolitan Congregations United, an advocate and also an activist and a resident of the 14th Ward. I'm here to testify today and asking you all to spend 20 minutes, 20, take 20 million from spending on SWAT, SLMPD, vacant positions and police overtime and put that into a non-police first responders alternative program for our youth and families. Reimagining our cities. For example, the juvenile detention center located at 920 Vander Vander, which contains 100 beds, but only 20 to 25 of those beds are being utilized. Reimagining that space for a safely home for youth and families, providing them the resources and support they're needing, especially when their children are going through the court system. This particular detention center is located between the Deaconess Foundation Courtney Ritter, and also across the street from the Urban League. Many of our youth are impacted by the system and funneled through the system from the city of St. Louis to State Streets and also um, zip code 63136, which is Jennings. 
I'm in those areas advocating and knocking on doors and canvassing all the time. And all of our families and youth are saying they need more resources and alternative programs for their children. So I thank you for this time today. I thank you for this space. And I ask you to take my test of testimony into consideration. Have a blessed day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, DeMonte Moorhead. Mr. Moorhead going once. Hello. Um, Mr. Moorhead. Yes, I'm here. Here. We can hear you. I am. Okay, for sure. So I was sure, like, my name is DeMonte Moorhead. How you doing, Miss Green, Miss Jones, and Mr. Reed? Hello. Good morning. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yep. For sure. I'm, I, I just, like, I'm an artist in the community, and I, I noticed that, like, the music, like, I feel like the music that we push to our kids and our individual people in St. Louis is, like, the worst music of all time. Like, you know, being, we can get, like, a musical infrastructure in St. Louis, like an epic center here, built here, and not allow out like and build our own artists and our own poets and our own you know like people that painters and things of that nature like then we can get an infrastructure here and push that out to the world like i feel like we will we will we solve a lot of problems in st louis just being the fact that you know like data these days it, it is so like google analytical that you just everything that you hear on the radio nowadays is violence. So like we have a lot, like we have the most talented, talented artists in St. Louis, I feel like. And I feel like once we get an epic center or at least a major label, we don't even have like a major label in St. Louis or anything, any type of infrastructure to push anything towards our, what, what we feel is good music, you know, because we do everything in our own ways. So I, I just feel like we need that. Like or and for for uh funding for our our children, like we need like to have them know what saving is or you know like at and in elementary school like we need to know them like they need to know what saving is or budgeting or things of that nature and uh, like at a young age. You know, I feel like that'll be Perfect, and I, I I do support defunding the police, uh, not defunding the police, but the I I support taking that twenty million from the police to fund it somewhere in the community, like I said, into like musical or poetic or somewhere art. Thank. You. Thank you, Mr. Mohead. We're gonna go back up the list and go back to Mr. Christopher Wilcox. Good morning. Good morning. That's my video. Doesn't look like I can start the video. Oh, there it is. Thank you. All right. Good morning. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Chris Wilcox and I live in the sixth ward. I want to speak to you today about the urgent need of the city to invest in meeting the needs of all of its people and that this investment should come from reductions in the city's vastly disproportionate spending towards St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department, currently 29% of the general fund. Crime has always been cited as an urgent problem that demands an ever expanding police budget and surveillance in St. Louis, all without the promised results. I am asking the city significantly reduce its spending on SMPD and put those funds directly toward meeting its people's needs for housing and health care. The, the expansion of the city's commitment to police comes at direct cost to the services its people need to survive. The city's local use tax, for example, was meant to primarily support housing and health care. Last year, the police took more funding from the local use tax than the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, the Health Care Trust, and building demolition combined. No one can be considered safe if they lack adequate housing and health care. One can be forgiven for thinking that St. Louis has set out to be a city that has more police than residents. 
The SLMPD has more officers per population than 97% of American cities. What do we have to show for this? St. Louis police kill more people per capita than any other city by a significant margin. The second most police killings are in Oklahoma City, which kills still less than two thirds as many people per capita as St. Louis does. Police have taken or destroyed the property of unhoused people for trying to shelter in tents made necessary by lack of permanent housing or even emergency shelter. Many of our unhoused neighbors relied on mutual aid from pop-up shelters to stay safe during the winter storms this year. Building on the progress we made last year, the city's budget needs to reflect the values and priorities keeping people truly safe by meeting their needs. Decades of police bloat has only added to the violence it was intended to solve. We should significantly replace SLMPD funding with alternatives to address harm and meet people's needs. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Wilcox. Next, Eric Shafi Bay. Yes, that's correct. Peace and love, how you doing today? Good and you. I'm doing well. So I'm representing the true de jure heirs of the land, Moorish Americans, the true and original American citizens. Uh, Article 1, Section 1, Constitution of Missouri states that all political power is vested in and derived from the people, that all government of right originates from the people, is founded upon their will only, and is instituted solely for the good of the whole. Section 2 states that all constitutional government is intended to promote the general welfare of the people, that all persons have a natural right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and enjoyment of the gains of their own industry, that all persons are created equal and are entitled to equal rights and opportunity under the law that gives security to these things in the principal office of government, and that when government does not confer this security, it fails in its chief design. With that being said, State officials, public servants have a duty and obligation to uphold the law of the land pursuant to their oath of office and supporting the Constitution for the United States of North America. Appropriate $1.8 million to the Re-Education Alliance for the re-education of those who serve the public regarding status, jurisdiction, and birthrights with respect of assisting the people as well as re-educating the people to realize their inherent and inalienable rights secured by the aforementioned Articles 1 and 2 of the Missouri Constitution, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution for the United States of America, treaties or the law of the land, etc. For example, I've noticed there is a $950,000 increase in the budget set aside for the Forestry Department to landscape and maintain LRA properties. These funds can be appropriated to small businesses to employ the people instead. In my opinion, all funds shall be reappropriated back to the people from whence they came so that they may enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness of their personal enterprise. And we also have, due to these things, we have policy enforcers that we call police officers who steals people's automobiles. They stop them in uh, traffic stops, which are commercial stops and um, they uh, violate due process. So with this right here, what I just mentioned, this will re-educate these uh, public servants on how to deal with the people uh, that they suppose to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bay. Thank you. Next up, Damon Starks. Hello, my name is Damon Starks. I live in the 19th Ward. I am here today to discuss how to use the 2023 fiscal budget. So instead of using 35% of the budget to fund the police, how about you use some of those funds to aid St. Louis Public School District for after school programs that give youth something to do. We all talk about how the crime rate is going up, uh, how many crimes there are committed involving our youth. With this, with this, it would provide a solution to that problem. As a mentor myself, I mentor teenage young men, and this is much needed. That way we will be okay. Um, I suggest we give to renters associations for, for rent, and as we know, rent is entirely too high just for 
here in the city of St. Louis. One bedrooms are going for $700 to $900. We need to make rent affordable across the board. Most jobs are paying anywhere between $13 to $18 an hour, which this means they were just working just to pay bills. We need solutions to get people ahead of that curve. How about giving uh, to, to homeless shelters and to give to the schools that way, the schools that are shut down, that way they can be restored and be utilized for homeless shelters. And also we need to give to grassroots programs, that way they can provide uh, resources for the community. With the community that have resources, we'll be able to eliminate a lot of problems here in the city of St. Louis. But instead, y'all, but instead, y'all focus on funding the police. Also, the homeless shelter, y'all also denied uh, Reverend Rice, who also had a building for the homeless. How selfish of you. Selfishness leads to nowhere. And it does not have time for her in the city of St. Louis. It's time to stop playing politics and get it together. Thank, Thank you. you. And y'all have a nice day. Thank you, Mr. Stark. You. Next up, Ishmaya Moore. Good morning. I live in the 25th ward and I work in the 11th ward. And I'm here to further promote um, the community's outstanding interest in reallocating funding away from the police department and into more expansive and holistic versions of public safety. I'm here to talk about how the city can invest in food justice as a means of um, contributing to its goal of public safety. In a 2016 study, 40% of St. Louis families with children were using food stamps, which is double the national average. One in eight people in St. Louis face hunger, according to the same study. And our community has a higher risk factor than the national average of poor nutrition, at least to other diabetes, cancer, um, according in, in addition to other ailments. So our city needs to invest in people's health as a means of their safety. I work for a food justice on called the Mush Cooperative. It's a 501c3 that's located in the Carondelet neighborhoods of South St. Louis. We, in the since we've been open in 2019, we've donated over two thousand uh, dollars to our community of all organic natural food. If the city were to invest into organizations like ours, they would be able to help the communities most in need with their nutrition, and it, and that would help the communities be able to embody uh, of revitalization that is interested in. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up, Rajia, Rajia Mumin. Rajia Mumin. Okay. Going on to Jeff Buck. Uh, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Jeff Buck, and I'm the president of the Board of Directors for Sanctuary and the Ordinary, or CEDO. CEDO's mission is to create good and dignified rental housing that is affordable for those that are earning less than 50% of the area median income using selective rehabilitation. In the last five months, we have completed the selective rehab of six large two-bedroom apartments. We completed the rehab of these apartments quickly with an average total cost of only $70,000 per unit. A portion of this funding uh, for this project is coming from a 10-year, $80,000 no interest loan from the Affordable Housing Commission, for which we are very grateful. The residents of these apartments are delighted by the quality and the energy efficiency upgrades. 
They're seeing substantial utility savings and are experiencing a rejuvenated life in their new home. Additionally, the neighbors are thrilled with the exterior improvements and the cleaning up of the property and the, the surrounding areas. Uh, while we believe it's important that the funding for these projects come from, uh, or a portion of the funding come from private sources, it's imperative that we and other nonprofits like CEDO obtain funding from public sources, and in this case, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Pu public grants are a reliable source of funding, um, and the funding from the AHTF uh, provides the credibility that private donors want to see. We at CEDO can do the hard work to help quickly mitigate the severe shortage of affordable housing, but we need the city's help and support. We ask that the city increase the funding of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund by 30%. We also ask that $10 million from the American Rescue Plan Act funds be put into the AHTF. Additionally, we ask that at least 20% of the funding is designated to selective rehab projects and that the city refine the grant process to encourage the use of selective rehab by nonprofits to quickly and cost effectively retain and increase affordable housing in St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Jim Roos. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Jim Roos. I am Executive Director of Sanctuary and the Ordinary, of which, Jeff, of which Jeff just spoke. Greeting to you, Lewis and Darlene, whom I know, and a hello to you, uh, Mayor Jones, mm -hmm. although I did meet you briefly last fall at a gathering at Barrett Brothers Park. Um, first, a quick story. Yesterday, I went to Lowe's for, a ma for mailboxes that had been back ordered. Uh, as instructed, I asked for Valerie in customer service. The woman responded, hi, Mr. Roos, I'm Valerie. I used to rent from you. You were so nice to me. I asked her when and where was that? She said it was on Park Avenue, 3850 apartment C, 40 years ago when my son was born. I was only 18 and you were so nice to me. Kudos twice. In 1989, a billboard on I-40 beside Forest Park offered sanctuary from the ordinary at the development in Wildwood at a cost of $400,000. Bingo, change the word from to in. And we had the description of what we did and the name for our nonprofit corporation. For 45 years, we provided sanctuary, not from, but in the ordinary. Prior to this meeting, I submitted to Stephanie Green, your secretary, CEDO's executive summary, our statement about using COVID funds and the February Post-Dispatch article about our work. Please reference them as well as our website. I ask that you fund the Affordable Housing Trust Fund with a 30% general increase others have requested. And, and I say, from the COVID relief money, add 10 million at the rate of 2 million per year, specifically for selective rehab of affordable rental housing. We have a proven plan and it needs a reliable and substantial source of financing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Shanice Lewis. Shanice Lewis going once, going twice, moving along. Next up, Dana Gray. Hello, this is Dana Gray. I cannot undo my video. There we go. Hello, thank you for allowing me the time to speak. Um, I wanted to address the panel um, with a request to increase funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund by 30% from 6.5 million to 8.5 million. I speak as a resident of the Eighth Ward, the Southwest Garden neighborhood and a landlord 
Um, also, I'm an employee of the Tower Grove Neighborhoods Community Development Corporation. We're an affordable housing provider in the neighborhoods surrounding Tower Grove Park. Our organization offers market rate affordable units, meaning they have not been created with low income housing tax credits. Our units are scattered site properties in historic buildings, and we utilize a selective rehab approach to keep our costs manageable. The materials and labor costs we have seen increase by 15 to 20% or more in recent years. With rising real estate values, many rental buildings have been sold in recent years and new owners have imposed significant rent increases. Existing tenants often cannot afford those increases and are forced to move. Current rental rates in our area for one bedroom units range from $1,000 to $1,200 and two bedroom units range from $1,800 to $2,000. Affordable rents should be no more than 30% of a household income. Accessible units are especially needed and modifying a building to accommodate a person with a disability comes with additional cost. In order for our community development organization and others similar to ours to be able to continue to provide rents affordable for working people, more funding is needed. Again, I ask you to consider an increase for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund by 30% um, from the current $6.5 million to $8.5 million. And I want to also just share that um, even when our organization has no units available for rent, um, we have a current list of people asking for um, a rental unit of between um, 10, 10 to 20 people, always on a waiting list, looking for affordable rents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gray. Thank you. Next up, Amelia Hinckley. Hi, my name is Amelia Hinckley, pronoun she, hers. I'm a resident of the 15th Ward, although soon to be a resident of the 17th Ward. Um, and I'm here today to talk, as many folks are, about what we define as safety in this city. Um, because if you look at the budget, it seems that the way that we're defining safety is through policing, which, as many folks have talked about, is not, uh, those two things don't equate. Uh, police do not equal safety. Um, and meanwhile, this past winter, I spent a lot of time volunteering with our unhoused, uh, with the emergency shelters that popped up. Uh, and I kept hearing city officials say over and over again, we don't have enough funding uh, to provide resources for the unhoused. We had to cut hours for the warming bus. We couldn't open enough shelter beds. Uh, and as a result, volunteers were left to pick up the slack uh, and open shelters at the drop of a hat to house 40, 50, 60 people. And even that wasn't enough. And as a result, people died. People literally froze to death this year because of the inaction of the city uh, to provide enough support and financing uh, and resources for our unhoused community. And to me, that screams a lack of safety when someone could literally die because they are just too cold and the city does nothing about it. And what are our 2000 police staff supposed to do about that? Because the only way I see them interacting with our unhoused community uh, is by beating them, by arresting them by just moving them out of people's way so that we don't have to face the reality of what we do to human beings in this city. And so it is absolutely despicable that we continue to fund a death squad of police officers in this city when we cannot house our residents. It is despicable. And I watch volunteers bust their butts night and day to do everything possible. And yet we have hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in a bank account somewhere that could go towards opening shelters, that could go towards funding social workers, counselors, addiction treatment facilitators, so many things that could actually keep people safe. And instead we fund people with guns and tasers who do nothing but bring violence into our city and it is despicable. And so we ask again and again and again to defund the police, to fund the things that will keep people alive and safe in this city. And we will continue to show up and do that until you all do what is right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Hinkley. Next up, Jenny Connolly Bowen. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? 
Yes. Okay, great. Uh, Mayor Jones, President Reed, Comptroller Green, thank you so much for having us today and for providing this forum. Uh, many thanks also to Ms. Stephanie Green and Budget Director Paul, excuse me, Paul Payne and all the staff who work hard behind the scenes to make everything happen with the budget. We appreciate you. Um, my name is Jenny Connolly Bowen, and I currently serve as Executive Director with the Community Builders Network of Metro St. Louis. CBN is a coalition of about 80 community building organizations in the St. Louis region. Um, and first of all, we are thrilled to see that no cuts have been proposed to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund this year. Thank you so, so much for understanding the importance of continuing to invest in this local asset. Um, we know, however, that the resources currently available to support affordable housing in St. Louis are not enough to address this massive need. So I'm here today on behalf of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Coalition to ask, as Linda, Todd, Chris, Jeff, Jim, and Dana, and some others have so far, that you consider increasing funding for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund by 30% for the coming year, uh, from 6.5 million to 8.5 million. Here's why, four big reasons. One, most importantly, is the St. Louis Affordable Housing Report Card has lifted up. There is an incredible need for more affordable housing in our region, especially for renters, Black households, and those earning less than 50% of the area median income. Given that at least 40% of trust fund dollars must benefit those with incomes at or below 20% of the AMI, um, it's very well positioned to help meet this need. Uh, number two, rising costs. A couple other folks have talked about this too. It's becoming a lot more expensive, in some cases over 30% more expensive, for affordable housing providers to do construction projects and deliver services like home repair. Uh, number three, inflation. The trust fund's $5 million funding minimum has not changed since it was launched in 2003, and we know that $5 million then is equal to roughly $7.7 million now. And number four, this is an opportunity for catalytic investment. As I think most of you know, uh, for every $1 the trust fund has invested since its creation, $18.55 has been invested by outside public and private dollars. So in sum, uh, we hope you'll consider investing 30% more in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund this fiscal year. It's an incredible, flexible local resource that really helps ensure our community has access to affordable housing and critical services, and it could do so much more with a bigger pool of funding. Uh, thank you so much for your consideration and your service to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Rachel Hurtado. Rachel Hurtado. I don't see Rachel. Okay, moving on. Benjamin Rosenzweig. Hi, uh, hello, and good morning. My thank, thank you, me. Mayor Jones, Comptroller Green, and everyone. My name is Ben Rosenzweig, pronouns they, them. I live in the eighth ward in Shaw. I'll be speaking on the proposed budget for public safety, and thank you for hearing my testimony today. So it looks like the city wants to give the police department $172 million, or just under a third of the city's general fund, which is a greater percentage than any other department in the city. And if the whole point of the police is to keep people safe and prevent crime, the current strategy of making the police department the number one priority of St. Louis isn't working. It's not working at all and it's making things worse. If you look at the numbers, so between 2010 and 2019, you can see how police spending consistently rises, but homicide rates don't drop. They just keep climbing along with that. And so clearly spending more on the police department isn't working to keep the people of St. Louis safe and alive. And so it looks like there's around at least 18 million of wasteful proposed spending on the SLMPD for fiscal year 2023. And that can be invested in our communities and transformative programs that actually keep the people of St. Louis safe. And so it's been said by previous testifiers, but between the vacant officer positions, uh, militarization programs like SWAT and ineffective surveillance programs like ShotSpotter, we're wasting around 18 million that can go into better programs. And so I ask that if this 18 million go into other programs like uh, affordable housing. Um, I also have said before, Cure Violence. And so, and once again, Cure Violence is a program that trains community members and neighbors to intervene in conflicts. And uh, with Cure Violence, overall homicide, homicide rates dropped 26%, but in some neighborhoods, homicide rates dropped by as much as 70%. So that's a program we're spending on. Another one is the behavioral health response. They have a crisis line. I have personally used that before to great effect. So this is just the tip of the iceberg of what we could be investing in. 
And uh, as a resident of St. Louis, I request that this request reallocating at least that wasted 18 million go into proven and effective programs that actually keep people alive. Uh, that, and that request be honored. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Maisha Johnson. Um, I'm having difficulties with my um, video. Please proceed. We can okay. hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Jones, um, President Ray, and Controller Green. My name is Maisha Johnson. I live in the 20th Ward. I'm the housing equity organizer for Metropolitan Congregation United. I see that a nice chunk of the um, fiscal budget for 2023 is set to go towards policing. I'm not saying policing is not needed. I'm saying that there are other ways to police communities. We could put funding towards community officers to mentor so many blocks, um, so many blocks around them and pay them um, to, to pay them for things and um, like buttons and t-shirts to identify who they are. These officers could be called to evaluate before calling 911. They also must live within the community that they serve. Also, housing is another avenue that could be taken into consideration. The conditions of some of my community members living um, experience is inhabitable and needs attention. Livable and affordable housing is a dream for many in, in St. Louis and throughout St. Louis. We are starting to see small children in the unhoused community. How far would you let that go? With the health, with healthy, with the healthy, safe space to live, not just a building, but a livable community, could add hope where there is so much disparity and feeling of being powerless and unheard. I have a son with mental issues who, at times, doesn't know how to express himself. His father was murdered in 2014 and still is unsolved. Since the age of 14, my son has been in and out of prison in the community center. The Community Freedom Center has helped us. They have um, given us restorative justice. They've created a program so we can communicate with one another. Um, we need more investments into our community to keep our community safe for all of us. This is not uncommon for black and brown families and low income communities. Often our children are written off as humans and treated like animals. This needs to and today, the 13th Amendment was implemented on December 18th, 1865. The amendment was to put in place to abolish slavery, and yet we still live it today. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak and the opportunity to be heard. Thank, Thank you, Ms. You. Johnson. Next up, Dean Mosley. Dean, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Maybe check the microphone settings on your device. Hello, can you hear me now? There you go. Okay. Hi, my name is Dion Mosley. I am uh, in the 20th board. I am the data lead for Metropolitan Congregations United. Um, and I'm really going to make this short because um, lots of people have already said what I've come here to say. Um, falling on the heels of Inez, Latricia, Amelia, uh, Maisha, Jay, and so many other people, um, I just want to reiterate that an increase in police funds will not help the people. Um, my story is not much different from many people, except I was born in rural Arkansas, and in rural Arkansas, as a little child, uh, my brother used to play a game where they would send me on a snipe hunt. And that was just to distract me. They would give me this imaginary creature to go find. And I would have to go find it for hours. Um, the first few times I didn't find anything because so snipes don't exist. But eventually I started seeing snipes in the trees and in the tall grass. I started seeing them uh, wherever uh, my imagination would see them. Uh, when we moved to the city, uh, um, like I stopped looking for snipes. I had other things to keep my attention. Um, but at the age of eight years old, I had to watch my mother cuss out a police officer for harassing her 14-year-old son. 
um, outside of his home. Um, at 11 years old, uh, my friend was murdered down the street from where we um, played. Um, at 13 years old, we were pulled over 13 times this, in one summer um, because we had a busted headlight that we could never find. Um, as a college student, I was pulled over every time I had more than two people in my car, every single time. All of this to say that an increase in police um, does not include in, increased safety within our communities. Um, more police, with more police does uh, mean uh, more crime rates because when you have police and you send them out on a snipe hunt to find crime, find crime, and you describe crime using the uh, symptoms of poverty and mental health issues, then they're gonna go on their snipe hunt and they're gonna find their snipes. Um, so I think that we should, my, my ask is that we take this money and instead of funding police, funding more police, uh, we invested in community programs, we invested uh, in homeless shelters and we invested in social programs that will help people. Um, let's end this snipe hunt today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Kim Jane. Mayor Jones, uh, Kim Jane sent her comments written this morning. Okay. I apologize for not being able to attend. No problem. Next up, ML Smith. ML Smith online. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Sorry. Okay. Um, good morning, Mayor Jones. Um, my name is um, ML Smith. I am um, an advocate and organizer with MADP, which is Missourians for Alternatives to the Death Penalty. Um, and in my role as Director of Community Engagement, I am um, as involved as I can be in local governance and public safety issues. So I just had a couple of comments today. Um, I wanted to first talk about uh, with public safety specifically, um, the end goal of, you know, the, the uh, police state in St. Louis. So we know that the real definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and, you know, expecting a different result, but not getting it. And I feel like we've had decades and several people on this meeting have spoke about the, um, the, 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 the numbers. We've had decades of, you know, policing, um, tough on crime legislation policies, uh, you know, arresting people, putting them in jail in this a cycle. And so um, at some point, our elected officials locally, state, federally, are going to have to accept the fact that, you know, being tougher on crime and more police in a, a militarized state is not actually what, you know, the citizens need to, um, uh, the support they need to actually, you know, get better in their lives so that crime will actually decrease. So I really just wanted to talk about that. Um, you know, we have a police state, we have a militarized state, a militarized city, and it's still not, not doing any good. Uh, there are still crimes happening. Um, there over the decades, these numbers basically remain the same. So it is time to actually reimagine what we feel like safety is. Safety is housing. Um, safety is uh, employment opportunities. Safety is being educated. Safety is uh, you know, being able to eat and feed your children. Most crime is out of desperation. Um, people who are addicted to um, a, a sub well, substance abuse um, addiction and uh, mental illnesses. So until we tackle what actually creates crime, we are not going to police our way out of this. People are going to go to jail. They're going to go to prison. And most, you know, I believe 80 or 90 percent of people in prison, they come out. So when they come out, these, th these things still exist. So we are actually going to need to reimagine what safety is and start doing those things and not feeling like, you know, we're just going to arrest and police and put prison our way out of these crime, these issues, because that's not actually what decreases crime. So I just wanted to come on and say that, and of course, thank you for all the work that you've done um, and uh, all of the uh, people in our city who really care and who really actually trying to uh, bring real public safety to St. Louis. So, and thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Next up, Ryan Smith. Ryan Smith. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, please proceed. Um, I want to uh, say uh, good morning to all in attendance today. 
I want to thank those that have invited me to participate in this valued community engagement. I am honored to be heard as a voice of the families and communities. I am a direct product of as a proud St. Louis native born and raised. Um, I want to also shout out to Jay Shepard, Dana Gray, Amelia Hinckley, <laughs> and Dean Mosby, Snipe Clint. Thank you for making that type of impact on me and I'm hoping that it also makes an impact on those that are listening. My name is Ryan Smith, currently a resident of the historical Bill area, Ward 4. This is not only where I call home, but it, as a trained social worker over the past 28 years and the last six years as a community health worker, I have also dedicated my nine to five life to also invest in my efforts into making sustainable change. I am here today to offer my testimony on how I think the 23 budget <clears throat> should be better dispersed to better impact my home and the thousands of people who live, play, and grow within similar zip codes. I am supportive of the need of law enforcement, but only with the people of this community. But its, but it's excessive financial investment has proven not to be effective enough to continue the same approach in the same fashion. Our city is in dire need of healing in more ways than just justice. It's beyond time we begin to respond in more productive ways that nurture our growth as families and communities, and not just as regulation ran by fear of those we pay to trust. Housing specifically needs to be addressed in unconventional planning and execution. 30% increase in affordable housing can prompt a visible change for the better. Now, landlords are not being held accountable, shelters are unsafe and limited, and the type of money we are talking about can be used to supply options for our families that are being dealt consequences equivalent on a, on a smaller scale to life sentences for having evictions on their credit history. I'll be the first to say money does not solve all, but I am not seeing the necessary effort either from the powers that be. And change cannot happen, continuing to make comfort decisions. Safety is more than policing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Adriana Darris. Hello. Hello. Okay. Yes, please proceed. Good morning. My name is Adriana and I'm in the 25th Ward. Thank you for having me today. Um, one thing that I want to talk about, something that Ben mentioned also, is that y'all have tried funding SLMPD as much as you possibly can, and it just doesn't work. Um, I would love to see what would happen if instead y'all fully funded our housing needs. Uh, if y'all, instead of funding $7 billion for vacant positions in the police, you put that $7 billion in education. Um, we're about to be in the summer. I'm sure we're gonna have a disappointing amount of police officers being extremely violent. Um, and, and that's on y'all. I mean, y'all are in the position to make these decisions. And for the past two hours, people have been saying to take money out of the police. And I really hope that y'all are listening to that. It's time to try something. It's something big, something memorable. And directly what we're asking for is that you take money out of the police and put it into these programs that make us feel um, excited and happy to be a part of St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Next up, Deborah Ahmed. I am here, I cannot turn on my video. We can hear you, please proceed. Oh, okay, good morning to you, Mayor Jones, uh, Comptroller Green and Board President Reed. I am here as a private citizen and resident of the 26th Ward of the City of St. Louis to ask for you all support and approval of two budget requests from Circuit Attorney Kim Gardner's office. Uh, specifically, they are for two issues. One is to hold uh, rogue police officers accountable uh, and be able to prosecute them for the use of excessive force and wrongful deaths. And the second to 
protect witnesses against intimidation when they are willing to testify in open court. The first issue would be at a cost of $1.2 million annually, and it would be the public integrity unit of the circuit attorney's office. The second one addressing uh, protection of witnesses would be uh, under the name of the Witness Protection Against Intimidation Initiative at a cost of a half a million dollars annually. I would strongly encourage you all support of this effort of the circuit attorney's office. It is greatly needed in our city. And uh, thank you all very much. And I also wanna say to Mayor Jones, thank you very much for um, allocating the $150 million for the um, rebuilding and renewal of North City. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, Vicki Bates. Vicki Bates. Um, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Please proceed. Um, okay. I just want to say good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Vicki Bates. I'm a home care worker and I am here to support health care workers safety training. I need additional PPE and training during the uh, pandemic, and I did not get it. I'm here today to speak for myself and other healthcare workers so we can uh, get safe, uh, be safe during the next uh, wave of COVID. Uh, here are some of the numbers uh, to paint a picture of uh, 4,096 nursing homes and residents in Missouri. They died from COVID. Uh, may there uh, uh, be a member blessing. Uh, workers have died in Missouri, and we lost about 68 nursing home workers. And God rest their soul, nursing homes and home care agencies need to uh, do better protecting the lives that have been uh, entrusted to them. Our union SEIU Healthcare has uh, thought long and hard about uh, the what, how to develop a solution. Well, we believe uh, better infection training will keep our residents and clients safer from infections and um, it will uh, help workers uh, be safe and better doing it uh, in the community. Our uh, training program, uh, which will be open to all healthcare workers with, uh, they are uh, union or non-union because we want to include and welcome everyone. We are asking the city of St. Louis to please fund training programs for healthcare workers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Ashley Mosley. Hello, um, my name is Ashley Mosley. I am a cook and a CNA at Chriswood Healthcare Center, and I'm also part of SEIU Healthcare Union. And Ms. Vicki and I are here to uplift funding for two important initiatives for worker safety, a worker safety advocate and worker safety training. Um, ARPA funds were appropriated by Congress to ensure to um, help devastated communities like ours deal with the awful effects of the COVID pandemic. When COVID-19 hit, it was really hard on healthcare workers. We weren't equipped to handle COVID-19. We didn't know how to properly utilize PPE. We didn't know how to screen employees and residents, and we didn't know how to properly disinfect for a pandemic. Um, our lack of knowledge caused residents and co-workers to perish. And although the pandemic itself caused a lot of fatalities, I believe that deaths could have been prevented if proper workplace safety training for healthcare workers had been widespread. SEIU's workplace safety training will prepare us for many workplace hazards, the spread of infectious disease throughout the nursing homes, hospitals, and the community, and fixing general workplace safety like trip hazards is also addressed through SEIU's training. 
The training will also teach workers how to effectively communicate with management. And this training is for union and non-union healthcare workers. We also need a worker safety advocate who can assist workers in filling out OSHA complaints and who will hold public hearings where workers, residents, patients, and the public can voice their concerns with long-term home care and hospital care in our area. SEIU Healthcare has collective bargaining agreements with 60% of the nursing homes in St. Louis City. <clears throat> and from where we sit, OSHA and CMA need to get more active and fix the terrible conditions in which workers are still forced to operate. Um, a worker safety advocate training will give our community the opportunity to get ahead of the game and learn from the mistakes in the past. These variants are constantly mutating and it's up to us to prepare because preparing, uh, failing to prepare is preparing for failure. And also we stand in support and so that solidarity with our allies on their statements with decarceration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, thank you. Benjamin West. Benjamin West. Um, good morning to the members of the board, to Mayor Jones, Comptroller Green, and to President Reed. Uh, I thank you for your time, and I would like to speak briefly uh, to ask the city follow through on its uh, stated intent to use use powers to perform emergency stabilization of neglected properties that are sitting in recalcitrant private ownership. Um, it was inspired by a story on January 10th from the Post Dispatch saying that uh, with uh, stimulus funds from the federal government and also money from the Rams settlement, the city does have existing powers. To, to do emergency stabilization on these properties and to effectively bill back to the recalcitrant, recalcitrant owners as, uh, as liens. And um, I can list recent examples of notable collapses that have directly endangered our neighbors. Uh, there was the Clemens House a few years ago up in North City. Just last year, a portion of the Lent Brewery collapsed and the bell tower of the Second Baptist Church, which I believe burned last year in Central West End, uh, is now itself in danger of collapse. And all of these structures, you know, either when they collapse, you know, when they collapsed or if they collapse, as I said, do pose uh, immediate danger to to the neighbors around. And I was, and I'm asking the city reflect its uh, revise its proposed budget to reflect its intent to try to stabilize some of these some of these abandoned structures instead of simply demolishing them. In the proposed budget, I see that the building commissioner under the uh, public safety presently has three million allocated just for demolition, same amount that was allocated last year. Um, and that does not appear to in indicate any intent to try to salvage some of these funds. Um, I should also remind you, the US Treasury Department did uh, did say that we uh, stimulus funds can be used to re rehab and secure uh, rehab and secure vacant buildings. And this issue, this issue does impact me directly. I live in the seventh ward uh, and uh, near me is a house on the 10th Street pedestrian mall that is such a such an abandoned structure. It's undergoing demolition by neglect. It's under death watch because it's already started partial neglect. But when this when this house goes, we are concerned that it will uh, spread lead and dust to everyone within the immediate vicinity, including my house as I'm catty corner to it. So, uh, and I'm asking again uh, that the city please, or city and Mayor Jones, please follow through on your intent to preserve some of these abandoned structures rather than allow them to collapse and potentially spread lead poisoning into our immediate vicinities. And so I thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Next up, Jamise Banks. Don't see Ms. Banks. I don't see Ms. Banks or Ms. Spees. Spees. Uh, okay, last up, Liz McDermott. Mayor Jones, I think Sarah Nixon from earlier has asked if she could be recognized and speak. Is it my turn or not? Yes, go ahead, Ms. McDermott. Okay. Hello. On behalf of an organization, the City Health Socialist Revolution St. Louis, um, I'm also a social worker in North County, working with children with significant mental health needs. On every occasion that I had to call the police, not only have they been unhelpful, but every single time they've made the situation substantially worse with their complete incompetence. Many social workers or anyone with any understanding of mental health at all would recognize that the police serve 
absolutely no purpose other than to escalate situations and murder those who they don't like. It is absurd that someone with minimal education and a demonstrated consistent inability to handle their emotions should be allowed to murder whoever they want with no consequences. This is not an issue that can be solved with more funding for training or things like that. The only solution is defunding. The police inherently serve to protect the interests of the wealthy and oppress the working class. Living in poverty is criminalized. Having a mental illness is criminalized. Simply existing as a human in an inconvenient space is criminalized. This has come up over and over again, and defending the police is clearly what those living in the city want, and as representatives of our interests, it's disingenuous to do anything else. By using the obscene amount of funding allocated for police for something that actually serves the community, like housing, healthcare, education, and generally helping to meet our basic needs, it will become apparent that the police only exist to enforce criminalization of being a member of the working class. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McDermott. And last but certainly not least, Sarah Nixon. Hi, all. My name is Sarah and I live in the 25th Ward. I'm a volunteer crisis responder with the Fatal State Violence Response Program, an initiative conceived of by the surviving families of those killed in state custody and murdered by the police. According to Mapping Police Violence, the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department has the highest rate of police killings by any population of any Metropolitan Police Department in the U.S. From 2009 to 2019, at least 179 people were killed by police or while in jail custody in the four counties of the St. Louis region. Since I began with the program six months ago, 10 people have been killed by the police and by state custody. Earlier this month, SLMPD officers murdered someone in front of his own home on the same block where they killed Kajime Powell eight years ago. Their terror spans so far and wide through space and time that they cannot help but kill twice in the same place. Through these experiences and my own analysis, I have come to believe that the Board of Aldermen should allot no money towards SLMPD, as they will never stray from their originary function as a militia that surveils, brutalizes, and seeks to control the movement of Black people. Instead, I hope you all pay reparations to the, fa to the surviving families of those killed by SLMPD and in state custody, and to those in our city who have been harassed, arrested, incarcerated, evicted, tased, maced, beaten, disappeared, sexually assaulted, and otherwise violated by public safety officers in St. Louis. I hope you all commit yourselves and our public monies to a future more just and beautiful than our present. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that concludes our testimony for uh, the fiscal year 2023 budget. Uh, are there any other comments from members of the Board of Estimate and Apportionment on the fiscal year 23 budget? I'd just like to say um, for the second year in a row, we've seen just a historic turnout. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with you, Mayor Jones. I think that you've done a good job in reaching out to people and getting more people involved. Uh, so, uh, you know, kudos to you for this. And we, we've seen two years in a row record turnout, you know, having served on the board of ENA for years. And the Comptroller Green could tell you some years we'd have, you know, we, we do the same advertising and everything that we're doing now, but we'd have two or three people show up. In some years, we had like no one show up, and uh, you know it's discouraging. Um, and for everyone who uh, took time out to comment today, those things truly do impact the way we budget and the way we, uh, you know, perform our jobs here. So, uh, you know, I think in some in some years, you know, a handful of people that showed up to speak up about the affordable housing trust fund. You know, they've seen more money go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund because they showed up here and spoke. So, you know, I just want to thank everybody who showed up and also just really give you a big, um, uh, you know, you deserve 
uh, a lot of credit for having so many more people show up. We just have never seen this before. So thank you. Thank you, President Reed. Madam Comptroller. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Mayor, I would also like to say um, that we have had quite a few who have been able to show up and comment. I also think that we ought to enter into the record those who would have uh, wanted to uh, be present, but instead uh, was unable to, but they did take the time out to send comments. And as I was reading through the comments that were sent in uh, by those who were unable to attend personally, uh, the majority of the comments are centered around the affordable housing trust fund and how they appreciate the fact that it's fully funded and uh, perhaps that there may be some additional funding added uh, to, to this year's budget. So I wanted to acknowledge those, those uh, additional comments that we did receive. I also wanted to speak on what we have heard, if that is appropriate to talk about what uh, we might uh, as a body uh, look at uh, as we go into our discussions uh, to uh, finalize the budget and bring it forth to the uh, May 1st deadline where it has to go to the board of aldermen. Uh, several people did speak, as I just stated, about a possible increase for the affordable housing uh, fund, as of course they are appreciative of the fact that it has been fully funded. Another set of, of, of comments came from several people speaking about the uh, possibility of funding for uh, a public integrity uh, unit that would uh, have an independent internal investigative effort uh, put forth along with the witness protection program put forth uh, housed in the circuit attorney's um, office. Uh, if that could be funded in this year's budget, um, and then uh, lastly, um, I will speak to the fact that uh, the last couple of people talked about the stabilization of the properties, vacant buildings. Uh, there are some public uh, vacant buildings that could possibly use some uh, stabilization as opposed to being uh, torn down. And then of course there are those private owned uh, vacant buildings where in the city could move to be, uh, build send an invoice to those private owners if in fact we were to um, uh, stabilize those properties uh, on an emergency basis. So um, not to um, uh, not speak on the, uh, the police uh, reductions and the uh, reimagining because I do believe in reform as well as transparency that, you know, that was the other comments, but I wanted to kind of bring to the top those three issues having to do with affordable housing circuit attorney and these vacant buildings. But of course the other uh, issues that were brought before us are extremely important as well. Uh, we even had an immigration issue uh, that was brought before us. So with that, I wanted to say that I know that we're going to go in uh, discussions to determine what if and uh, we can do to support what our public has brought before us today. And I wanted to say I am very much in support of, of the uh, top three items that I brought uh, forward, the circuit attorneys, uh, public uh, integrity unit. Uh, we need to look at that. Uh, a possible increase to affordable housing, as well as looking at securing uh, as many vacant buildings that we deem that can be that can be saved. Uh, as, so those are the kinds of things I like to to see us uh, support in this year's budget, uh, along with some uh, reimagining, if if possible, in terms of public safety. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Comptroller Green. Um, I think uh, I was also. Um, I also took note of uh, a lot of the testimony that was uh, offered in support of uh, the circuit attorney's public integrity unit and witness protection, which uh, we well know is included um, in this year's budget at $1.7 million. Um, and hopeful that that stays uh, in the budget 
Um, and, uh, you know, we're taking advantage of, um, you know, these once in a lifetime opportunities through ARPA uh, to uh, expand affordable housing in the city of St. Louis uh, through our work with SLDC and CDA. So just hopeful uh, that that money continues uh, to flow into communities, as well as how we've been renegotiating our development deals and including affordable housing um, as uh, developers uh, uh, build more market rate uh, housing uh, in the city. Uh, examples of those are the Butler Builder, Butler Brothers Building, uh, Jesuit Hall, as well as um, the city foundry projects. Um, and uh, again, want to thank everyone uh, for submitting testimony, either uh, written or uh, in person. Uh, we had over 50 people uh, today uh, expressed their concerns about the budget and uh, which is great because uh, these are city funds and and uh, we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to express themselves and express their concerns and that's what we're here for. Um, so uh, if are there any other uh, comments or concerns about today's uh, hearing. Okay, seeing none, I, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn this session of the Board of ENA. Second. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded. All those in favor, please signify by voice vote of aye. 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 Motion passes. We are adjourned. Have a great weekend, everybody. Yo.